This morning we're going to wrap up our consideration of the book of 1 John. And we're going to do it by looking at uh, five different closing statements, if you will, that John makes in the last part of chapter 4 and then chapter 5. At this point, at the writing of this, 1 John, this letter of 1 John, John is the elder statesman of the church. He is the only remaining elder, if you will, apostle of the original 12 apostles. He started as the youngest, you'll recall that. He uh, had a a very unique and special relationship with Jesus to the point where in his writings in the gospel, he described himself as the one, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He had a very special relationship with Jesus. He was also the theologian of the Twelve. You would think they were all theologians. Matthew wrote a gospel, and certainly it was theological in in perspective. But John's understanding of who Jesus, this man with whom he spent only three years, John's perspective on who he was, enabled and filled in by the Holy Spirit of God himself, his understanding of Jesus really took it to a different level. He, he understood Jesus from the big picture. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created. John tied that to Jesus. In the gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus. And then he goes on and John writes the last book of our New Testament, the book of Revelation. So John had this global perspective on who Jesus was at that time and even who he is today because John understood that he was eternal. One might expect John's last statements in this this epistle to be overwhelmingly complex and pregnant with hidden truth available only to the most theologically adept. But quite the opposite is true. Apparently, John had concluded that the good news of Jesus is actually quite simple, and it's available to all. I think I've referred before to the fact that I had the privilege of serving under Dr. John Maxwell. I was on his staff. If you don't know that name, John today is one of the leading leadership gurus, not just in the church, but in the world at large. He spends most of his time now flying all over the world uh, by personal invitation to give leadership tutelage to uh, governmental leaders, to world leaders, international world leaders. I'll never forget, John, uh, even though I was only with him for a year before God called us to go to seminary, uh, I've never learned so much about leadership as during those 12 months. One of the things that I kind of look back on it with a little bit of, if, if I would have just been a little more mature at that point, John several times would look at me and say, John, you've got to understand something. Life is just not that difficult. It's not that complex. And I would, I, I would kind of cringe inside. Maxwell, you, you don't get it. You're missing something. There, there is so much, there's so much working down under the surface. What do you mean life is not that difficult? Now after, well, almost 40 years and a little bit of ministry under my belt and life under my belt, 
I have to admit, uh, John, you're right. You're right. You see, one of the marks of true genius is to make the profound simple. Uh, to make it available for general consumption. Less is more. We hear that today. And it's never as true as it is with this issue of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is. John apparently understood this. And for John, this is what all of Jesus all of his time with Jesus boiled down to, came down to one thing. Life is all about one primary relationship. My relationship with God. The health of that relationship, my relationship with God, affects every other relationship and every other part of my life. It's all about one primary relationship. You get this right, and you're going to get the rest of it right. It's really that simple. I'm going to read five statements. I'm going to read and consider them each one at a time. I'll ask you to stand, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'll just read the first one, and I won't ask you to stand after that, okay? The first one we're going to look at is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. John says this, Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Father, as we try and understand what John has boiled all of his exposure to the very Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who took on human flesh and invited John in person to walk with him and follow him for some three years. And now John boils all of this down. W w would you help us, Holy Spirit, to see the simplicity of it and to understand the, the reality that all of human life boils down to one central issue. What do I do with God? Do I have a relationship with him? Holy Spirit, help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let me read it again. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. This is not saying that if you experience fear, you don't love Jesus. That's, that's not what's going on here. Too often uh, that has been taught and uh, that just produces guilt. And it kind of, we lean away from Jesus instead of into him with that. What, you, what is he talking about? He's talking uh, about a kind of fear, and we'll look at the context here in a moment. But we've got to understand fear itself is morally neutral. There's nothing right or wrong about fear. God created us with the capacity to be afraid, to fear some things. Some things it's good to be afraid of, like big government. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I kind of got it. Um, here John is talking about the fear of God's judgment. He's talking about a constant state of being afraid of displeasing God and the punishment that would naturally result from that displeasing of him. You see, God knows 
something that we're, I think, just starting to understand in principle. God knows that fear is not a long-term motivator. You remember, uh, for those of you who are anywhere close to my age, I know that driver's education has really taken a different spin now, and you've got to sign up and pay for it, and it's not provided in school anymore. But uh, when I was going to school, it was part of the curriculum when you got to a certain age, and uh, you went to your driver's ed class, and uh, they would have uh, simulators that we would drive. I, I, I had never thought about it, but I guess those were the precursor of modern video games. I don't know, but it was, it, they, they were fun. Uh, but do you remember during that class, if you took it, um, and they started to do a little bit here about 10 years ago, and then it dropped immediately away. The, the, at the end of the class, uh, to... <sighs> to impact you with the power of the projectile that you're going to be uh, wielding, known as an automobile, uh, being its driver, they would show you the worst of the worst, the bloodiest car accidents that had been caught on film. Do you remember those? And, and I mean, if you had a weak stomach, the floor got dirty. It was gross. And again, I believe, I think I saw some ads starting to do that here about 10 years ago, and then they kind of evaporated. The reality is that fear, fear is a short-term motivator. It goes away pretty quickly, actually. You forget those pictures of the gross automobile accidents. Hmm. God understands that long-term motivation, uh, it only comes from one source. There's only one thing that really is a long-term motivator, and that's what John is talking about here, and that's love, a loving relationship. What fear motivates us to do is to back away from whatever relationship that we're in that's causing the fear, to back away from it. What love encourages us to do is to lean into whatever that might be. But fear causes us to back away. That, that's why John says that perfect love casts out fear. Now, what does he mean by perfect love. I, I think we've had enough time together. You know by now that word perfect that's translated in English as perfect does not refer to something that's flawless, that, that is absolutely perfect. And, and if, you, if I had read the previous verse, verse 17 of chapter 4, John makes this statement that love grows more perfect so think about it. Can, can something that is absolutely flawlessly perfect get more absolutely flawlessly perfect? Of course not. So what's he talking about? This word that, that in English is translated perfect would be more accurately translated in our context as mature or complete. Mature or complete love in a relationship with God specifically, casts out fear of his punishment, of his anger. Don't need to be afraid of that anymore as his children. This, this word, every, everything that could reasonably be expected of any, at any particular stage of development. Uh, so a, a, a child can certainly be totally uh, what they should be as a child. But is there more maturity waiting for them? Of course, as they grow, as they experience, as they, as they learn from life, they become more complete, more mature. And that is what John is talking about here. The, the reality is the, the important question regarding my relationship with God is, is it growing? Is it getting better? Is it becoming more complete? Is it becoming more authentic? 
Is it penetrating ever more deeply into who I am, into my heart of hearts, into my mind, even into my body? Is it getting better? That kind of love, that kind of love relationship with the Father casts out the fear of what might come next. This kind of love issues an unshakable confidence in my relationship with God. So that's the first statement. Second statement, chapter 5, verse 3. He says this, loving God means keeping his commandments. Now, if he would have stopped there, we would all kind of groan and say, okay, heard that, been, been there, done that. Uh, well, duh. But then he goes on. The next phrase is so important. He says, loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. When I'm truly in a love relationship with Jesus, I want to do what he wants me to do. This, this is a true principle for every human relationship, whether it be my relationship with God, my relationship with my, with my spouse, my relationship with my kids, if I'm a kid, my relationship with my parents, my relationship with my teachers, my relationship with anybody else. When I have a healthy relationship with him, what they're asking me to do is not burdensome. It's not a pain in the rear. You have got to be kidding me. You know what breaks my heart? When I hear especially a young person, and could be either a teenager or a young adult, and they're trying to figure out what God wants them to do with their lives, and uh, they make some statement like, you know, <clears throat> I, I just hope God doesn't ask me to be a missionary to Haiti to go to the deepest, darkest, whatever. And, and the reality is too many Christians live their lives afraid that if they really trust God with everything that they are, if they really say, your will, not mine, I will do whatever you ask me to do. If I, if, if I say that, he's going to make me do the most painful. Ah, I don't want to go there. That's a total misunderstanding of the heart of God. When we have the kind of relationship with him for which we are created, which he designed us with, he wove it into the fabric of our, of our DNA. When we have that kind of relationship with God, whatever he wants us to do, first of all, he prepares us for it in advance. He may not tell us exactly what it's going to be. But let, let's say God does call you to be a missionary to Haiti. He's going to put such a burning desire deep within you to do it only what God wants you to do. He's going to break your heart for the Haitian people to where you can't wait to get there. It won't be a pain. It won't be burdensome, if you will, in John's terminology here. He is going to change your heart to the point where you want to do nothing more than that. Very simple principle. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. <laughs> Third statement. Chapter 5, verse 12. John says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. It really doesn't get much more simple than that. Jesus is the only source of life. If you have a relationship with him, you have life. If you don't have a relationship with him, you don't have life. This is not just eternal life either, of course. This is life right here, right now, to the fullest. It's the relationship with God for which we were created. When I, when I do funerals, 
and I've done a few. Especially in the last couple of, well, in the last probably 10 years. No matter who the family is, whether I know them or I don't, whether they have a spiritual background or they don't, the, the, the Spirit leads me to a, a verse in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 24, where Jesus makes a statement. And he said, He who believes in me has passed from death into life. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is talking to live people, right? I mean, people are physically actually listening to his words, but he is saying that until you believe in me, you're dead. When you choose to trust who, that I, who I say that I am, then you become alive. One of the phenomenon uh, of the last uh, probably 10 or 15 years that has puzzled me the most is our cultures uh, were obsessed with, uh, now that, uh, come on, brain, don't fail me now. Zombies, The Walking Dead, movies ad nauseum, TV shows ad nauseum about, about zombies. And I've wondered, why? These things are ugly. Oh my goodness. And, and, and it makes no sense. We all know that that's impossible. But, but, but here they are, and they are invading almost every part of our contemporary entertainment. Why this obsession with the walking dead? And the reason I believe that the Holy Spirit has led me to bring this particular statement of Jesus to the forefront in the context of the death of a loved one, I have a suspicion. Much of our culture today, especially the last two generations, feel like they're walking around dead. They have no purpose. They're at a total loss as to why in the world they exist. And zombies may be the most graphic description of how they see their own heart. Zombies hadn't been created when Jesus made his statement. But it's true nonetheless. He who chooses to trust himself to me has passed from death, the walking dead, <laughs> into life. It's what you're created for. And without it, you will be, you will continue to be the walking dead. But once you come into that relationship with me, life starts to happen. Real life, not just eternal life in heaven. I'm talking life right now. What did Jesus say in John 10, 10? I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's his will for you, for all of us. Fourth statement, verse 13, chapter 5. He says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that you may know. You've heard the name John Wesley. John Wesley uh, was an Englishman. <laughs> he was an ordained priest in the Church of England. One of the most highly educated priests of England that ever graced the planet. But he didn't have a clue what a relationship with Jesus was. 
I think I've told you the story before. He, he, his heart was good. He, he really had good intentions. He wanted to make a difference, but he was the walking dead in this context. And he was having no impact. He went to, uh, he came to the colony at that time of Georgia. And his desire was to convert the heathen Indians, to bring them Christianity. I forget how long he was there, two or three or four years, considered himself a total failure, left with his tail tucked between his legs. And he was on a ship on the way back to England and in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a huge storm hit and the ship was being threatened to be torn to pieces. And he was terrified. He was out on board, on, up on deck, hugging one of the masts. There was another Christian who did have a relationship with Jesus on board, and he recognized Wesley as a clergyman, probably from his attire, and he said, my friend, if our ship goes down this evening, do you have the confidence that you'd be with God? in heaven. John could not answer that affirmatively. He couldn't say, yeah, I'll be in heaven. Obviously, he survived. The ship survived. He got back to England. He kept struggling with this haunting question. I'm a priest in the Church of England, and I don't have the confidence that I'm going to heaven. And then he went to, uh, somebody was preaching. It was a place called Aldersgate. And the preacher was preaching, I believe, from the first chapter of Romans. And Paul talks about salvation being by faith alone. And all of a sudden, like a lightning bolt, it hit Wesley. And Wesley's description of what happened to him at that moment is, and I believe I'm quoting almost correctly, he said, my heart all of a sudden was strangely warmed and I knew that I was a child of God. First time But he was excluded. Whew. Miracle worker. Thank you, dude. Okay. The Church of England forbade him to ever preach indoors in one of their churches again. And you know why they forbade that? Because they said, you can't be sure that you're going to heaven. Nobody can be. <laughs> eternal insecurity, if you will. You can't be sure. You can't know. John experienced the reality that because of his relationship with Jesus, he knew. Now, now what is it that made him know? Uh, let, me, let me read the verse again. <laughs> I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The key is believe. Now, of course, you understand this word believe. John is not just talking about a mental ascent. I believe that Jesus 
in today's context. Uh, I believe that Jesus was a real human being, a real man that actually walked the planet for 33 years in the dusty streets of, of modern day Israel. I believe that. That's not what this belief is all about. It's not even believing that, he, that Jesus was the Son of God. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about a, a mental ascent. This word believe that John uses here indicates a level of relationship, a level of trust where I choose to trust everything I am to the reality that Jesus is who he claimed to be. I live and die. I trust my life whether or not Jesus actually was who he said he was. It's that level of relationship, that level of trust. That's when, when you have that level of relationship with God through Jesus, that's when you can know, you can know that you have eternal life. What did the Apostle Paul say in, in I believe, Romans chapter 8 uh, verses 15 and 16. He says something like this. He says that when we have this relationship with God through Jesus, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you have that witness? Very simple question. Do you have that assurance deep inside of you right now that you're a child of God? If you breathed your last, if your next breath was your last breath, do you have the assurance that you would be in God's presence? Do you know that you know that you know that you're a child of God? You understand why, why John wanted us to be so sure of this? an unshakable confidence that we'll spend eternity with Jesus. One last, one last statement. This is in verse 21 of chapter 5. John uses some very favorite terminology. I think we looked at it last week. He starts it out by saying, dear children. This was a, a term of endearment. It, it was not a condescending Oh, you sweet little unknowing thing. No, he's wrapping these believers up in his arms and saying, you got to hear this. Please hear this. My dear children, he said, verse 21, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. I, I, I think it's significant and very appropriate that John should make his last statement, his last summary statement, basically the same as Moses' first commandment. Do you remember what the first of the Ten Commandments is? I'm the Lord your God. I'm the one who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Very first commandment. All the rest of the, the, the nine other commandments flow out of that first one. And here John is saying, don't let anything or anyone take God's place in your heart. There is only one true God, except no substitutes. Don't give your heart to anybody but God. You're created for that relationship. In fact, you're created for a relationship, you and I, relationships in general, but not just with anybody. The primary relationship, the only relationship, the only one worthy of your heart is Jesus. Is church the only place that you would hear that? I hope not. I hope, hope you hear it at home. I hope, hope you heard it at home. There is no other 
relationship. Jesus is the only one worthy of your heart. One of my mem mentors was, he was my theology prof in seminary, Dr. Dennis Kinlaw. One of the books that he wrote, he made a statement and it stuck with me again and again and again. In fact, I just shared, with, shared it with somebody this week. He said, anytime anyone or anything becomes essential to your well-being other than God, you have an idol. <laughs> My wife doesn't like that statement. but I believe it, and I think she does too. We love each other so much. But if she ever becomes more essential to me than Jesus, I've got an idol. There's only one who is worthy of your heart. Don't let anybody take his place. <laughs> when all is said and done, life really is simple. You're created for one primary relationship, and that relationship is with the one who created you, Jesus himself. Interestingly, that relationship is optional. You don't have to let that relationship happen. You don't have to even want it. God leaves that up to you. But if and only if you choose that relationship with God through Jesus, only then, your life begins to shed fear, fear of all kinds, actually, begins to enjoy an unshakable confidence that you are a child of God. You know that you know that you know you are his child. And you are safe forever. It would be inappropriate of me To allow the words to come out of my mouth that have just come out of it, I believe directed by God's Spirit without asking you a question. Do you have confidence that you're a child of God? I want you to bow your heads with me.